Freedom Park here at UofL. It's a response to this big Confederate monument at the end of this park. Um, they got some, some cool information here. Through the colonial period, a small minority of African American population was nominally free. The minority, this minority, grew dramatically when consistent with the stated principles of the first American Revolution. Slavery was abolished in New England and the mid-Atlantic states between 1777 and the 1820s. At the same time, the more southerly states, while contemplating the end of slavery in the, 19, in the 1780s, became its hostage after the invention of the cotton gin revitalized the peculiar institution of slavery. By 1830, there were nearly 2.7 million African Americans in the United States. 13.7% of whom were free. Although they were not enslaved, free people of color were treated as outcasts throughout much of the North and South, banned in most of the Lower South, and tolerated grudgingly as an alien element in the border and Upper South. Frequent mob violence often reduced the struggle for equal black citizenship to a desperate search for a safe place to live, ideally with the possibility of land ownership, work for decent wages, or the opportunity to practice a trade. Intense racial prejudice both North and South scattered free African Americans throughout the border states. states. The North and the Western frontier in towns, cities, and rural enclaves where opportunities were greatest and resistance was least. Free people of color were usually considered subjects, not citizens of the United States, with few rights and little legal protection. However, unlike enslaved African Americans, free people of color were persons, not property, under the law. Their births and their deaths were recorded. They could marry legally, own property, and enter into contracts. And because enslaved African Americans were too small a minority to overthrow slavery from within, free people of color played a central role in establishing black communities, founding black institutions as the backbone of the anti-slavery movement. They got a timeline here, and it shows you where the dates was. So this is around 1850. The free black community of Louisville. So between 1830 and 1860, the free African-American population of Louisville increased from 232 to 1,917, or by 726%. And Louisville became home to the largest concentration of free people of color, both in Kentucky and in the upper south, west of Baltimore. Locally, free people of color did not live in segregated neighborhoods per se, but were clustered in alleys or on certain blocks or parts of certain streets. They were disproportionately young and female. Most were desperately poor with the hope of owning and operating businesses blocked by laws enacted to prevent competition with whites and their employment opportunities, limits of labor and domestic service. Still work was plentiful and a handful of more for fortunate free blacks worked as clerks, musicians, teachers, teamsters, blacksmiths, barbers, and on the steamboats that piled the river. Louisville was a decidedly hostile environment and weaving a few hundred Free people of color into a community depended on astute leadership in the 1830s. Three individuals emerged as the principal architects of Black Louisville. One, Shelton Morris, founded the first black business in Louisville in 1832, a barbershop and bathhouse under the old Galt House. Another, Washington Sprouting, speculated in real estate and by the 1860s became the first African American in Kentucky worth more than $100,000. Together as brothers in law, Spradling and Morris. Spradling and Morris once owned much of the eastern Russell area in the 1830s. Yet another, Eliza Curtis Hunley Tevis, became the only significant free black landowner in the surrounding county where she purchased the land that developed into the Newburgh Petersburg community by the 1850s. Through their leadership and institution building efforts, there were eight independent black churches in Louisville, most of which also sponsored small schools in or near the old downtown area. The establishment of a free black community in the midst of slavery was a defining moment in the struggle for freedom in Louisville. If the history of African Americans in Louisville begins with slavery, the history of the black community of Louisville begins with this free black community. So, um, the three people was Shelton Morris, Shelton Morris, and then so Sprouting and Mortis, uh, Eliza Curtis Hunley Tevis. So, Sprouting, whoever Sprouting was, Washington Sprouting. So, it was Sheldon Morris, Washington Sprouting, Eliza Curtis Hunley Tevis were the first three folks to establish a black community in Louisville.